in this season, in a Christmas season, there are so many parts of the season that add extra expectation. I mean, even just think about the songs that we sing. We sing like it's the, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the happiest season of all. I mean, we th- sing things like uh, we're walking in a winter wonderland, okay? And we have this expectation at Christmas time, just kind of this I- internal desire that everything is right. It's almost like this utopia wonderland kind of pursuit. And there's something that we just, we long for everything to just be, be perfect, okay? And so I remember that Rebecca and I, my wife and I had the opportunity many years ago to go stay at a friend's place in Colorado. And they had this little cabin and it was up in the mountains and it was during kind of the Christmas season. It was a winter time and it was just picturesque. I mean, it was like there's a, a smooth blanket of snow outside and at various points you just looked out the window and the, the fire was running but we looked out the window and these huge chunks of snow are just silently falling outside and it was just like the perfect setting. I remember thinking that is like the perfect setting for Christmas. So I I want you to go there with me, okay? We're talking about finding the perfect Christmas. So I want you to go there in your mind. I want you to imagine a cabin in the woods, (laughs) fire crackling to the side, snow falling down outside the window. I mean, just look at this. Like when I think of like maybe the perfect place to spend Christmas, I mean, I look at this and this just looks like perfect. In fact, if you just now tuned in live online, this is being brought to you live from Colorado, deep in the mountains. <laughs> That's how seriously we take our Christmas series, okay, on location today. And so when I think about like the, the most perfect Christmas setting. I mean, this is what I I, I think about. You know, and on our hearts, like we kind of desire that perfect thing all throughout Christmas. We desire whether it's, you know, the get together that just went perfect and the the traditions that that are just as we remembered it and the recipes that just tasted how we thought and the gifts that just were the right exact gift. And we have all of this kind of internal drive to find that kind of wonderland. But here's what we know. I mean, really deep down we know. I mean, no amount of peppermint mochas is going to like achieve that desire deep down. Because here's what I really think is going on. I think deep down under the surface, we are truly desiring something much deeper than just a good Christmas season. I think there's deep down longing in our hearts that the festivities of Christmas time can't possibly deliver. But here's the irony. The irony, I think, is that the actual message of Christmas actually delivers. Like what the reason we celebrate, the whole purpose behind Christmas, actually delivers on what we're longing for in the deepest places of our heart. And so we're going to take a look at a a passage through this season. It's Isaiah chapter 11. And I want us to look at what is it that Christmas really offers. And how does that really, really get to something deep down in our souls that we long for? What is Christmas offering? Let's look at this here in Isaiah chapter 11. If you have a Bible or Bible app, um, go ahead and open there. You can look in your concordance. Um, and open to Isaiah chapter 11. I just want to read the very first verse and just kind of get kind of the framework here and what we're looking at and and where in time this passage was was spoken. So let's look at this. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. All right, so I want to just take a look at this here. We've got, uh, this is prophecy, is this type of literature. So there's going to be a lot of symbolism and imagery here that, that this passage is going to talk about. And so let's just start with the imagery. What you have is a stump. A tree has been cut down. It is dead. All that's left is a stump. But miraculously, this is the symbol 
out of this dead stump, a miracle is going to happen. A, a shoot or a branch is going to grow out of it. So out of this dead, dead stump, out of death, life will come out of it. This is the imagery. Now, what is this an image for? Well, it describes this stump, the meaning behind the stump. It describes it as the stump of Jesse. Okay, so let's just kind of get our bearings here. Who is Jesse? Jesse is the father of the most famous king in all of Israel and really one of the most famous kings in history. He is the King David, the famous king of Israel and of, uh, of the Jewish people and of God's people. Jesse is the father of David. Okay, so understanding the background of Jesse and David is critical to understanding this passage. Here's how this plays out. David was the most famous king, the founder of an entire dynasty of kings that survived throughout the rest of the uh, history of ancient Israel and ancient Judah. David was the founder of that. In other words, David was a king, but Jesse was not. There was a, another king from a different family when um, David was a boy, okay? So here's how this played out, and this is significant. Jesse was a guy who had flocks of sheep, and one day a prophet came up to this guy who otherwise would have been kind of just a random uh, guy who lived in uh, Judah among God's people, just a random Jewish family. And this prophet named Samuel approaches Jesse and says, I believe God is telling me that one of your sons is going to be the next king. That would have been very surprising. Like why not the son of the current king? Why a son of this random guy, Jesse? And so Samuel said, um, can you bring your sons before me? Do you have sons? And Jesse says, actually, I have several sons. And so he brings who he assumed would be the son who would be crowned king. He bring, brings the oldest. And Samuel says, no, that's, that's not him. And then he brings the next one and the next one and the next one. And after several sons, he's like, no, none of these are. Did you bring me all of them? And he says, well, there, there is the one other one. He's the youngest. He's actually out tending the sheep right now. He says, well, I want to see all of your sons. And then, that, then I say that, I want to see all of your sons. Bring him in. And so they're all kind of like, all right. So they bring in this little shepherd boy named David. I mean, think about it. He's coming straight off the field. He probably smells like sheep. <laughs> he walks in. He's dirty. He's standing before this famous prophet, Samuel. And Samuel says, that's the one. And he says something interesting. He says, because... God doesn't see like humans see. God sees something different. He doesn't judge people the same way humans judge people. He says he's the one. David, as a little boy, is anointed to be the next king. Several decades later, he becomes not just a king, a powerful king. He establishes Jerusalem itself. He becomes the most famous king. And from his line, it starts a dynasty of rulers. At the time Isaiah 11 is written, um, the like 13th Davidic king, like 13 generations later, there is a Davidic king sitting on the throne, a king named Ahaz, the great, 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 great grandson of David is sitting on the throne. Okay, so what is this tree that's been cut down? It's a family tree. It's the tree started by Jesse. It's a family tree that's been cut down. Now, why did the family tree get cut down? Well, because you've got to understand what's happened with this king Ahaz. Ahaz, who is the king over the southern part of the kingdom, Judah, Ahaz is the wickedest, most evil, vile king in their history. And if you know the story of their kings, that's saying something. This guy, he just did literally, I mean, there's nothing good said about this guy. Let me give you some examples. He goes into the temple that his ancestor Solomon, the son of David, built for God's glory. He, built, he went into this temple that was God's temple. He had him to start taking out some of the valuable uh, instruments of the temple that are there to worship God and bring glory to God. He had them use them to make other idols of false gods, and he had them set up all over the kingdom for people to worship them instead of God. You know, like the exact opposite that a king was supposed to do. A king was supposed to direct the whole country, the whole nation, the whole people's attention to their true king, God Almighty. But he is setting their attention to these idols. 
If that's not wicked enough, one of these idols is they would do child sacrifice to these idols. And Ahaz actually sacrificed one of his own sons to that false god. To punish them, God did what he sometimes did with this kingdom to get their attention and to call them back to himself. He had another army attack them. So the, the Syrians at began attacking their, their country. And instead of repenting and turning back to God, Ahaz decided to turn to the wicked Assyrians instead and ask them for help. That proved to be a bad idea. They oppressed them even more. And when Ahaz found himself in the capital city of Damascus, the capital of Syria, to, to figure out some kind of peace, while he's there, he sees their ornate altar to their false god and he sends word back to Jerusalem to the high priest over the temple to the one true living God and he says hey here's instructions I want you to tear down the altar to the living God that my great grandfather Solomon built I want you to tear that down and rebuild an altar with that looks just like this altar in Syria I want to I want us to give sacrifices on this pagan altar I mean, it does not get much worse than that. And so why are, is God foreshadowing that this tree is going to be cut down, that this, that this line from David is going to be stopped? Why? Because they have turned from God. And eventually, a couple generations later, the Babylonians would come through and would destroy Jerusalem, and that would be the end of having a Davidic king on the throne. But what's promised here? Out of that dead stump will come new life. There will be another king that will come. But did you notice it's interesting? It doesn't say it will come. The shoot will not come from the stump of David. Did you notice that? It's going to come through David's line, but it's significant that it says it will come from the stump of Jesse. That means while literally it's coming through David's line, positionally, it's coming alongside David, coming from the same father. In other words, this king that will come from the line of David will be so significant, he will be like a second David, come from the stump of Jesse. You follow this logic here? This is promising a significant king that will bring life. Now, if you are living in, in Judah at this time and you have this wicked king that cannot do anything right and constantly turns away from, from the living God, this has got to be about the best news you could hear, that, that there will come a king who is this, a second David, a king that will bring life back and will bear fruit. Powerful statement but here's what it's going to say. It's going to say that this second David is actually going to be even better than the first. Look at how it goes on and describes this next king or this king that will come one day. Verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's actually something that was also said about David. God's spirit empowering him. But look more specifically what it says. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now it says the Holy Spirit will be on this king. That's good news. That means God himself is empowering this next king. But what it says next is really unbelievable. I mean, it's describing kind of this trifecta of empowerment. It's describing these three ways that would really make just the perfect ruler. I mean, you can't ask for more than what it's just about to describe. Let me show you these three things. First, God himself will empower him to have wisdom and understanding. In other words, can you imagine having a ruler over a nation or a kingdom or an empire or, or even just a leader or boss that was miraculously empowered by God to no matter what the situation was, that person could see with perfect wisdom and understanding. That no situation's too complicated, no situation's too difficult, where that leader, in this case, this king, would not be able to perceive what the right next move is. He has perfect, miraculous wisdom to know what's right, to be able to see what's right. Man, 
that'd be something incredible in a leader, to always know what the next right move is. The Holy Spirit is gonna empower him with that kind of wisdom. That's the first thing. But then the second thing is not only will that person be able to see what's right, he will have the power and the might to do it. It's one thing to know what's right. It's another thing to have the power to accomplish that. You might work for a company and say, man, I wish the company would do this, but that's above my pay grade. I have no power to make that happen. You might look in your family and say, I wish our family did things like this, but I don't have any power to affect that change in my family. I mean, it's one thing for a ruler to know what's right. It's another thing for them to know what's right and have the power to do it. And this new king will be miraculously given God's power to do it. Here's the third thing it says. It says, and he will have the spirit on him to have the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. To have that kind of understanding and knowledge. What is this describing? If you have that kind of knowledge, it's you have positioned, or if someone has done that, they have positioned themselves to stop and think about for just a moment who the Lord is. What do I mean by that? Well, many of us probably here, or many of us watching online might say, oh yeah, I believe in God. But have you ever stopped to just think about the implications of what that means? The moment I say, yeah, I believe in God, that means I'm saying I believe in a being that invented everything, including me. Knows the inner workings of everything better than any other being, including the inner workings of me and of you. If I say I believe in God, then that means not only does he know everything, but that means that he actually, if he has the power to invent the universe, he has power over the universe. He has actually all the power. In fact, the concept of power itself emanates from him. He's the source of all power. That means if I say, yeah, I believe in God, I believe there is a being of unimaginable power. And that being knows me, knows my life, and actually made me for his purposes. He has purposes of my life and knows my life intimately and in detail. See, when you stop to think about well, what does it mean the Lord, there is this awe, this reverence, this respect, almost this, like, I'm going to walk carefully here before God. And it just dismisses, it just jettisons this idea of, you know what, God, no thanks, I'm just going to live my life how I see best. Man, if I stop and just consider, if I say I believe in God, what that means, that's what the Old Testament describes as the fear of the Lord. What this says is that this new king not only knows what's right, has the power to do what's right, but he will do it. That's a third thing altogether. There are plenty of times when someone knows what's right and has the power to do it, but they don't. They don't have the courage. They don't have the conviction. They don't have the desire. They just rather do what's most comfortable for them. But this king, this ruler, knows what's right, can accomplish it, and will do it because he walks in the fear of the Lord. He walks with reverence and respect and will do what is right. I mean, can you ask, I mean, if you found a leader, a ruler, someone like that, I mean, sign up to follow that person because that is pretty much the perfect scenario. They always know what's right, they always have the power to do it, and they always will do it. That's the perfect scenario. You can't ask any more for this king. What good news to them when they have this wicked king who, by the way, never seems to know what's right. He is powerless. He has to rely on the power of another wicked army and doesn't, couldn't care less about pleasing God Almighty. What good news that another king is coming who will be the perfect king. That had to be good news for them. But then it says one more thing. It says, and his delight will be the fear of the Lord. Now this word delight is actually a play on words. It's a derivative of the Hebrew word in here. That's all through here. The Hebrew word for spirit is the Hebrew word ruach. And it is a derivative of that. And that word delight, it's translated, it literally means in the Hebrew fragrance. So it means to him, the fear of the Lord is this beautiful aroma. 
the sweet fragrance. It's his desire. It's what he wants. It's what he craves. If there's one thing in his life, there's one thing that dominates this future king that's promised, the one thing he wants is the fear of the Lord, to follow the Lord. And, and in fact, think of it like this. If there is a whole audience of this king's life, all the people who witness his life, there's only one that he cares about. You know, we have uh, different audiences in, in our lives. You know, we have various different people who are witness to our life. And a lot of times we uh, live our life, we can often find ourselves living our life for that particular audience. Um, uh, several uh, months ago, my wife and Rebecca were, my wife and I, Rebecca, were able to accomplish something that I, I wasn't sure was going to be able to be accomplished, but we convinced our kids that they loved the quiet game. <laughs> it's glorious, okay? And so here's how this plays out. You know, we'll, we'll all uh, go into the living room area and there'll be one judge and then everyone else sits on the couch and they're trying to sit there as silently as they can. There's no giggling. There's no laughing. And they, you try not to even move, okay? You try not to even blink. Just like, just statues. And there's one judge that's trying to determine, you know, which one moves first or smiles first or giggles first. So it kind of was, would play out something like this. You know, I'd be the judge first. And, you know, there's, you know, I'd say, oh, um, all right, Scarlett, you, you were the quietest. You're up. And then I'd go sit down and I would freeze. And then Scarlett would look and say, oh, mama, you're, you're the quietest. And so then mama would get up and she would look and then she'd be like, okay, Nehemiah, you won this time. And then my, my four-year-old son would, would get up. And, and one time he gets up and he looks at all of us and we're all wide-eyed, just frozen, staring at him silently, not even moving. And he realized something. He has a captive audience. <laughs> and so what happened next? I was a little surprised. He just decided to just get up on the ottoman and start dancing. <laughs> He had a little dance party and we couldn't stop him. We just were all frozen looking at him, not knowing what to do. And he took full advantage of it, okay? And just had a little dance off with himself. All right, now, so here's the thing. We have audiences in our life. They witness our life. And so often we play to those audiences. So think about the different audiences that we have in our lives. You know, you have, you know, where you live. So maybe the apartment building or the, the condos or the neighborhood where you live. You have all those people who kind of witness your life. You have uh, where you work. Your coworkers or where you go to school, there, there's an audience, and they probably have their opinions of your life. They're, they're an audience of your life. You have your family. You have your extended family. They witness your life. You have your friend group. They're an audience to your life. They witness your life. In fact, in our era, that, that friend group witness to our life is actually even broader because, you know, we have uh, social media now. And so now there's people from previous eras of our life that are witnessing our lives. People that you knew from back in school, back in high school, maybe college, people you knew in a previous city you lived in, now they're witnessing your life. You have audiences that witness your life. So a lot of times we kind of bounce like, which audience am I going to play to and live for? Well, what it says about this king is the fear of the Lord is like a fragrance to him. His delight, his desire is just making God happy. In other words, this king, what makes him so perfect is there's just one in his whole audience that he cares about, what God the Father sees in him. I've heard some put it like, he has an audience of just one. It's God. So who is this king? And, you know, how does this play into Christmas? I mean, why are we looking at this passage at, at, at Christmas time? Well, I want to just jump to one part of the Christmas story. It's in Matthew. I'm just going to read to you one verse. It's at the very end it's in, of Matthew's account of the Christmas story. And it's a small detail in here that... that points back to Isaiah 11. It's Matthew 2, verse 23, and this is talking about Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus. It says, And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken of by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So this is talking about after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Eventually, um, Joseph and Mary moved to this town called Nazareth, and that's where Jesus grew up. In fact, 
to this day, Jesus is known as Jesus of Nazareth, right? I mean, that's still known to this day. And Matthew is saying that is significant. He says that fulfills something the prophets say. Now, if you go back to the uh, Old Testament prophets, here's what's interesting. You will never find in the Old Testament prophets a place that says that the Messiah would grow up in Nazareth. It doesn't say that. So then what is Matthew referring to here? The, the link here is that the name Nazareth is almost identical to the Hebrew word for branch. And so in other words, Jesus, if we were to kind of bring that connection into kind of modern language, here would be the significance. It's that Jesus all throughout history and for the last 2,000 years has been basically known as Jesus of Branch Town. And Matthew's saying, that's significant. Because he's the branch. He's the king. He's the king that was promised. It's not just a coincidence that he grew up in Branch Town and has been, been known as that throughout history. It's significant because he is the fulfillment of what was prophesied in the, in, back in the prophets. That there would be a king, a branch that came from the stump. That life from death. That he would be this king, the, the second David in the line of David, but so significant like a second David, but even better than David because he would have perfect wisdom and he would, would have perfect power and he would have perfect conviction of obedience to God the Father. He'd live a life that all that mattered to him was living a perfect life of obedience and he would. He would live for just that audience of one. That king is what is promised. That is what arrived in Bethlehem that day. The perfect king. You know, there's one particular Christmas decoration that I think taps into that wonderland longing that we have at, at Christmas time where everything just seems right. It's a snow globe. Because you look inside just this, this perfect little you know, globe and inside, there's just this little scene. It's usually just something picturesque. Like in this one, you know, you've got this little building and a little house. It's even got a little church in there. And it's got, you know, these, these little perfect evergreen trees. And, and man, this is like the perfect little village. There's no crime in this village. There's no traffic. Everyone's nice in there. In fact, the weather's good. All you have to do is just turn it over and shake it a little. And perfect little glistening flakes just surround this perfect little wonderland. And it just kind of is a symbol of what we desire at this time of year, that everything is just right. So what's the perfect Christmas? Maybe for you it's uh, Noche Buena and all the families there and getting along. <laughs> maybe, it's you, maybe you go home for Christmas and you're just, I, I, when I go home, I just, I want all of the traditions to be how I remember it. All the, all the food to taste the way I remember it. Maybe it's when Christmas morning and all the presents are opened. It was all the right presents. Everyone's happy and everyone got everything that they wanted. And we have this desire for that. And I think that desire is for something deeper down, a deeper down longing than just the decorations. And see, there's things that happen in our life and they, you know, they crack the snow globe, so to speak. But here's the irony. What's promised at Christmas, the message of Christmas, actually fulfills that deep down longing. What arrived at Christmas was the perfect king. And so what does that mean? That means a few things for you. Here's the first one. Some of you today make Jesus your king. Some of you know about Jesus some of you would say, I believe in Jesus. Some of you would say, I'm a Christian. Some of you would say, I'm a Catholic. Some of you would say, I go to church all my life. Some of you would say, I go to church every Christmas. Some of you would say, yeah, I, I, I believe in Jesus. But some of you believe in Jesus, but have not made him your king. If you believe in Jesus, you're believing in a king, a king of kings. Make him your king today. 
What this passage offers uh, shows is two options. Ahaz, who brings death and destruction, or Jesus, who takes that death and brings life. Some of you today are saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I run my own life. I make my own decisions. I make my own destiny. I, make my, my, I have my own dreams. I have my own goals. I live my own life the way I want to live my life. Then Jesus is not your king. Make Jesus your king today. Why? Because he's the rightful king. And he's the perfect king. That's a vulnerable step where you choose to surrender your life and make him your king. You say, I'm going to, Jesus, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to submit to you. Or some of you have made Jesus the king of most of your life, but you're holding on to this area. Make him your king today. Another thing, some of us need to make Jesus our king, but some of us need to trust Jesus as our king. Some of us say, yes, I've made Jesus, he's my savior, but he's also my Lord. He is my king. But you come around to this time of year, and this is the time of year we kind of take inventory of the previous year. We take inventory of our life's progress. And so sometimes at this time of year, we're sorting through disappointments. Do you trust Jesus as your king? Do you trust him with your life? Do you trust his rule and reign over the universe? Because here's who your king is. He's trustworthy. He's worth surrendering to. He's worth submitting to. Do you trust him? Because here's who he is. He's a king who perfectly always knows what is right. He has perfect discernment. He sees. He sees what's right in your, in your life. There's no circumstance that you might have that is too complicated for Jesus. He perfectly knows what's right, unlike you and me. He not only perfectly knows what's right, he has the perfect power to make it right. Unlike you and me, where we're constantly aware of our limitations of our power and the things that are outside of our control, they are in the hands of Jesus. You can trust your king that he knows what's right, has the power to do what's right, and that he has the fear of the Lord, the conviction to do what's right. He is God himself. He is perfectly good. He will do what's right, unlike you and me, who often don't have that courage. He will do what's right. In fact, he promises that he is working together for good. All of the circumstances in your life. So what might be cracking your snow globe is you're not trusting your king this year. But here's the last thing. Live like your king. Because your king had a perfect view of of who his audience was, he lived for just one audience. What audience are you living for right now in this season? Because that can really crack your snow globe. You know, a lot of times um, we fall into the trap of comparison. And this time of year especially, we get Christmas cards in. And of course, the Christmas card is the most beautiful picture that could actually have been accomplished with that family, right? Right? It took 157 different snaps to get that one picture they just mailed to you. <laughs> and so you get that Christmas card in, you get the letter of all the things that have happened, and they're the highlights. They're the best things. And so it's easy to get all of that and kind of look in that and say, wow, there are a lot of good things going on in their life. Or maybe it's the, it's the, the scroll on social media. I mean, no one posts ugly pictures of themselves. It's the scroll of all the cleaned up, perfect pictures. It's the highlights of their life. And it's easy to start looking around at what every, what's going on in everybody else's life and compare ourselves to them. What audience are we playing for? Sometimes it's not the comparison trap. Sometimes it's the expectations. Maybe it's you go home for the holidays or you're around your family and it's that one little comment from your sibling it's that look from a parent of disapproval or disappointment. Or it's that comment that was made years ago, but it's still ringing around in your brain and you're trying to live for the expectations of someone else. Who's your audience? Live like your king who perfectly, courageously 
had only one member in his audience that he cared about, God the Father. What does Christmas deliver? The perfect king. Who is this king? I want to close by reading one last passage that explains who this king is. I'm going to jump over to John chapter 1, verse um, 45 and 46. I just want to read this to you. This is early in Jesus' ministry when the disciples are starting to figure out who he was. Here's what happens. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him to whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, you come and see. You know, the significance of Jesus being from Branch Town, that's significant because it was not an impressive place to be from. And in fact, it was this tiny little overlooked, unimpressive little village that no one expected anything good out of. And here's Nathaniel and Philip having this conversation and the question is asked, and this was kind of the sentiment always when it was talked about Jesus being from Branch Town. He said, really? You're telling me the Messiah is from Nazareth? You're telling me the king of the Jews is going to be from Nazareth? Of all places, little, humble, no good Nazareth? You're saying the king is from Nazareth, the king of the Jews. No. It's the king of kings who's from Nazareth. It's the Lord of lords who's from Nazareth. It's the one whose name is above every other name. That's who's from Nazareth. It's the lion of Judah. It's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who's from Nazareth, who's from this little know-nothing town. Why? Because the son of David, who was raised up, is because God doesn't see how humans see. He looks at something different. He looks at a perfect king. Who is it from Nazareth? It's the one who's the way and the truth and the life. It's the one who's the bread of life, the living water. That is who is from Nazareth. It's the Savior. It is the King. It is the one who loves you so much that he laid down his crown in heaven so that you could pick a crown up. It's the one who came down to earth and was willing to be cut down to death, only for life to spring out of it so that you and the dead pieces of your life can actually find life in him who saves. Who is it that's from Nazareth? It's the servant of God who, who came down to earth and did not, even though he was equal with God, he became nothing. He became obedient to God. He lived a life of an audience of one delighting in the fear of the Lord, so became obedient to death. And not just any death. I mean, even death on a cross. Humiliated, stripped naked, and tortured, and dying on a cross to pay for our sins so that one day God would glorify him and raise him back to life and lift that name, the name of the king, the name of that Christmas king born in Bethlehem would raise that name above every other name because one day at the name of that king, at the name of Jesus Christ, every single knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and he is the true king of the universe. He is the perfect king. And he's... He's your king. He's your king. And if he's not, make him your king today. Make him your king today. I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Some of you are here and today you need to make Jesus Christ your king. Don't just say you believe in the name of Jesus. Do you realize he's the king of kings? to put him on the throne of your life. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. Make him your king. The one who saved you and came to rescue you, make him your king. And if you're wanting to do, take that step today, I want to lead you in this simple prayer. And simply say this, say, Jesus, thank you. Right there in your heart, silently say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. You paid for my sins. You rose again from the dead and you're going to rise my life out of these ashes. Jesus, I make you my king. I surrender to you today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I believe there are people who put their faith in Jesus today. Can we just celebrate with them? If that was you, if you made Jesus your king, praise God. Greatest decision you could make. And we actually want to celebrate with you. So here's what I would ask you to do. If you are here and you put your faith in Jesus, there's going to be pastors at the end of this aisle, this one and at the end of this aisle over here. And at the end of the service, you pull them aside and say, hey, I took that step. They just want to let you know what the next steps are on this journey. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can take that Get Connected card in front of you. You can fill that out. There's a place that says, I put my faith in Jesus. Just take that and you can put that in one of the offering boxes or take it back to guest services. Just let us know. Let us celebrate with you and let us walk alongside this with you. If you're watching online, there's a place you can click online. We want to know. We want to know that you put your faith, that you made Jesus your king. You can indicate that online as well. Church, we're going to close with a song today. And here's what we're going to be celebrating that our King is the one who is the great victor for all of time. He had victory over our circumstances. He has victory over our sin. He has victory over death itself. He is the great victor. That's who our King is. Let's stand as we sing this together.